guess they're telling me we're ready to go. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Please remember to fill out uh, your attendance record, and then also please remember to fill out the program evaluation. And if you could give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Our speaker today is Dr. Bruce Kloster. Uh, Dr. Kloster is, or uh, did his residency in uh, clinical pathology at uh, Washington University and then did a fellowship in blood banking and transfusion medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Subsequently, he was an instructor in uh, blood banking and transfusion medicine at the University of Medis or Minnesota and uh, then uh, director of the transfusion and uh, service at uh, State University of New York. Currently, he's the medical director of the LifeServe Blood Center in Des Moines, Iowa, and he has kindly accepted our invitation to uh, drive up to Ames today to update us on when to transfuse platelets, crowd precipitate, CMV, and other blood products. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Cluster. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Is it working? All right. Well, thanks for having me here. And I'm a little warm, so I have my jacket over there. Um, I wanted to start with a very serious joke. Uh, this is, uh, there's a guy on Sunday morning, and he's asking his mom, why do I have to go to church? The sermons are long and boring, and the people race out of the parking lot afterwards. You can tell they didn't want to go to church. Why do I have to go to church? And his mother said, well, because you're 52 years old, and because you're the pastor. <laughs> and our pastor actually said that joke in church. And when he said the, the sermons are long and boring, people were looking around, did I hear that right? So I'd like to talk about uh, blood products. And you know when you sign up for something like this, you have a piece of paper that you sign that says, I promise not to talk about products that I have a financial relationship with. Well, I am medical director at LifeServe Blood Center, and I you know, distribute products, blood products, and all of your products all come from our center. And so if I'm suggesting that you give platelets to a 5,000 count patient that's bleeding, yeah, I guess I'm suggesting you use LifeServe platelets. I don't have, what can I say? I'm biased. We'll talk about platelets, carb precipitate, CMV negative products, irradiated, washed, and granulocytes. Platelets, there are two kinds you probably recognize, um, apheresis and acridose. An apheresis product is collected off of an apheresis machine, takes about an hour and a half with uh, two needles on the donor, and it's one adult dose. An acridose product is four to six whole blood platelets, each one coming from a unit of whole blood, and that is an adult dose. Each has three times 10 to the 11th platelets, and the QC process is the same. Each one's LUCA reduced. All of our red cells and platelets are LUCA reduced, um, and have less than five times 10 to the six residual white cells. The QC process, again, is the same for acridose and apheresis. They're both cultured for bacteria. They both have a five-day shelf life, and we don't have enough of either to supply all the need. Let's look at percent platelet apheresis products that are in different countries. You can see the countries on the left side, Canada, Netherlands, Norway, Australia, uh, use about 30 or so percent apheresis products, and the rest are from whole blood products. And so it really varies quite a bit across the world as to who uses apheresis more or, or whole blood more, but they are very common. Uh, my friend Joe Sweeney from Brown University was at Rhode Island Blood Center uh, for years. And the fourth bar from the left is from Rhode Island. So you can see he's had a lot of experience using pheresis about 30% and whole blood platelets about 70%. So some of the data we have here is from his uh, center. Now one might think that a four to six donor exposure is a lot worse than one donor exposure with an apheresis product. So I, I like this graph so much that I had an extra handout made so it, it could be easily read. And I like to point out that for HIV, when I talk to a patient, I do tell them that the risk for HIV is about one in two million. And that is about the same as the risk of getting killed by lightning. And it helps them relax a little bit. Um, so 
that this shows some of the, the common um, problems of, of everyday life in the lower section and transfusion in the upper section. One thing I wanted to point out was the TACO, transfusion associated circulatory overload, fluid overload. Okay, we're all familiar with the term, but do you realize it's one in 100 transfusions uh, are said by, by studies to have TACO reactions, fluid overload reactions, which is kind of spooky, I think. Another thing that's surprising, uh, for me at least, was if you look at one in 1,000, death from medical error is one in 1,000, or even a little more common than that. And that's surprising. This is uh, talking about the TRAP study, platelet increments, and the green bar is just to take some of the noise out of this situation. I want to try to focus in on a couple little red circles there. The one on the left is for filtered platelet concentrates, and the other is from filtered apheresis products. On the left side, the transfusion results, one hour post count there was 43 versus 44, very similar. One hour post count increment was 22 versus 24. And the, uh, interestingly, the percentage that have one hour post count less than 11,000 is uh, 26 and 30 percent. So remember, when you're giving a dose of platelets to this kind of patient, these patients are not at 50,000 and going up to 80,000. These patients are at five going up to 15 or 20, and we're happy about that. Um, and so uh, it, it doesn't always happen that you have a, a huge bump in platelets. And uh, 11,000 or less is not uncommon with this type of patient, with chemo chemotherapy patient. Let's look at reaction rates between whole blood platelets and apheresis platelets. Acridose are whole blood platelets, of course. Um, Joe, uh, actually, you no, know, this is a study from transfusion, and the apheresis products here had 30 reactions to about 4,000 products, and the reaction rate was 0.75%. Whole blood platelets, 63 out of about 6,000 products, the reaction rate was about 1%, very similar. The p-value is uh, 0 0.022, and obviously very close. Um, yeah, these are very similar. Uh, Joe also looked at bacterial screening. So when we do cultures for bacteria in our platelets, all of our platelets are cultured, uh, which ones show up more? Well, actually, the whole blood derived platelets, about 42,000 of those, initial positives was 14, confirmed 4. The confirmed positive rate was 0.0095%. Apheresis, 4,000 products, 18 initial, Two confirmed, that confirmed positive was 0.045%. And then at the bottom line there uh, is five unit pools, and he did a calculation. He multiplied the 0.095% times five to try to arrive at the rate of infections from pools of platelets, and that was 0.048. So very similar in terms of culture results between the two products. Not surprising. And bacterial sepsis, he looked at this as well at Brown University in, in Rhode Island. In, from 97 to 2011, 20, uh, 2,700, sorry, 270,000 white blood derived platelets, that's 55,000 doses. And 27,000 apheresis process, pr products, that's 27,000 doses. The septic reactions were five, three to the whole blood, and that would be one out of 18,000 pools and two to apheresis products, one out of 14,000 pools. Mortality from bacterial sepsis during this time was, he had one in a whole blood platelet concentrate, and that at that time, they weren't testing uh, pool products for bacteria back that far, uh, but in 2008, there was an apheresis product that was tested by culture and was missed, and it happens. Uh, we only catch about half the, the infections with uh, this back T system. So at any rate, these are not very uh, dissimilar numbers in my opinion. And what about refractoriness? Well, if you're giving four to six donors, you might think you'd have a lot more trouble with development of HLA antibodies than platelet refractoriness. This is from the TRAP study. This is cumulative refractoriness. Uh, and the, the top line there, the, the yellow one, is a control. The other three, the UVB platelet concentrates, the filtered platelet concentrates, and the filtered uh, apheresis products all have about the same uh, development of refractoriness in patients over time. This slide shows lymphocytotoxic antibody positivity, another measure of refractoriness, and you can see control 
is high, but the other three are basically the same. So no, it doesn't make a difference if you give four to six donors, you're giving so few white cells. We're getting it down to less than five times 10 to the sixth. And in some cases, I believe the acridose are superior uh, in some particular cases. Let's look at this situation. Is this patient refractory? Well, he's got platelet counts of 2,000 every morning despite transfusions. Okay, is he refractory? Who would, who would say this guy's refractory? Anybody? Okay, well, uh, one question to ask is, is the count going up to 15,000 and then drifting back down to 2,000 by the next morning? Could happen. Or is it staying at 2,000? Well, the way to tell, of course, it's a 15 to 60 minute post count. And if it's actually uh, staying at 2,000, then yeah, he's refractory in, in the classic sense. And he's got antibodies to either HLA or platelet-specific antigens as most likely to ha be happening. So we'll talk about HLA-matched pl platelets. Patients, of course, are not gonna make antibodies to their own HLA type. And so if HLA platelets are ordered and an HLA type is obtained, we'll call around uh, to various states, uh, Wisconsin, Texas, California, are some of the first ones we look at. They have huge computer lists of donors with the HLA types. They'll find an HLA type that matches the patient and then those platelets usually work very well to bump the platelet count. Unfortunately, they call in a donor the next day to come, uh, you know, they, they find the computer list at name and they, find, they get the donor to come in the next day. Then it takes a day to process and culture, another day to transport, so it may take two to four days. And the question is, what kind of products would you want to use in the interim while you're waiting for those HLA products? You see, nothing's basically working here is our problem with the refractory patient. So I posit that it's acridose, and the thought is a refractory patient with, let's say, antibodies to half the population, if you give an apheresis product to this patient, it's all or nothing. It's gonna work or it's not gonna work. There's a 50% chance of it working. With an acridose product, you've got four to six doses, and there's a better chance that at least some of these platelets are gonna get through and have an effect. And as we recall from before, you don't always, in a patient with a 2,000 platelet count, you don't always need to get to 30,000. Uh, and you don't always get to 30,000, even with non-refractory situations. You need to get over 10,000. And so having something work um, is, in my opinion, a, a nice thing to fall back on. Guidelines for platelets, these really vary. I've looked at hospital guidelines from various places and they, they vary quite a bit, so this is not hard and fast by any means. Acute blood loss, platelet counts of 30, 50,000, those are commonly used by people to, as targets to, to be above. Chemotherapy, again, 10,000 is a very common number. If patient is on uh, heparin or if they have uh, an infection, some people like to use 20,000, it's not uncommon. Massive transfusion situations or interoperative bleeding, uh, 80,000 is a um, pretty common number. And for neurosurgery, post-CP bypass or intra-aortic bi balloon, platelet counts above 100,000 are usually considered a good idea. Now for dysfunctional platelets, either caused by Plavix or an inherited situation, if you had a platelet count of let's say 200,000, but they're not working very well, I would recommend getting up to 230,000 and then assuming you've got about 30,000 platelets in there that are functional. And so uh, that is another situation where you would end up needing platelets. Cryoprecipitate, well, what is it? How do you make it? You take a bag of frozen plasma and thaw it slowly in the refrigerator at four degrees instead of rapidly for use at 37 degrees. So a precipitate forms in this situation. It's got fibrinogen, a lot of fibrinogen, factor eight, factor 13, and BW factor. And about a half to a third, or a third to a half, of fibrinogen that is in the 200 mil plasma bag is now contained in the precipitate at the bottom of this bag. So that precipitate can be spun down and separated. And then you leave the precipitate with about 15 mils of plasma, and that's called one bag of cryoprecipitate. We pull five of those together for your convenience in the OR or wherever, so you don't have to hang separate little bags. And then we refreeze that five pack pool. And when thawed again at 37 for immediate use, all the precipitate dissolves. So it's all liquid, of course, when it goes into the patient. And the typical adult dose is 10 to 20 bags, and that's a good slug of fibrinogen. 
when would you use cryoprecipitate? There are many possibilities. Um, massive transfusion protocols often have this built in that after a while it's re recognized that if you give platelets, plasma, red cells, you are in a massive situation, massive transfusion. You often run out of fibrinogen, but you don't recognize that necessarily. And yes, it's a good idea to measure fibrinogen periodically in, in that setting, I believe. And whether you measure it or not, I think it's good to include cryoprecipitate, which most, most systems do that. Hemophilia A, well, yes, it is an indication for cryoprecipitate. However, that's been really replaced by factor VIII concentrate. Not surprisingly, of course. VW, uh, multiple, uh, VW disease, rather, is another indication for using cryoprecipitate. Now, there are some VW disease situations where you can use DV, DDAVP to stimulate production of, or release of VW multivers. But you could also use HUMATE-P or alphanate. Those are a couple of factor eight concentrates that have a lot of VW factor in them. So um, there are other alternatives you could do to cryoprecipitate if you wanted. Congenital fibrinogen deficiency, that would primarily be a, a need for cryoprecipitate, although I've heard that there is a new product out there uh, that is um, fibrinogen concentrate. And I don't know anybody who uses it yet. It's not in the Des Moines area. It's not here in your pharmacy yet. But it may be of value. Uh, unfortunately, with a brand new product, it may cost a lot. Um, so it's, it's, I, I'm not sure much, I know much about fibrinogen uh, concentrate at this point. I don't know what it costs. Factor 13 deficiency is rare, but this is a good time to use car precipitate uh, because it's one of the only products that has a concentrate of 13. DIC is again a situation where you run out of fibrinogen sometimes, you don't recognize that. Uremia. Um, VW multimer platelet interactions are affected by, uremic, by uremia and uremic plasma. And it's not completely clear why there are chemicals in there that cause this to a certain extent. And you can overcome this uremia, which appears as bleeding despite having normal coags and normal platelet count. And so you give cryoprecipitate, it's got VW multimers that overwhelm the, the problem. And that works well in uremia. You could also give DDAVP, or you could use the humate P or alphanate. Um, fibrinogen low uh, are another indication, obviously, for giving cryoprecipitate. If you're going into surgery, I would think you'd want to be above 100 for the, for the fibrinogen level, since the normal level is 200 to, say, 500 in that range. Let's go to a more controversial topic, uh, CMV negative RBCs and platelets. I'm going to talk about five different uh, specialty groups of platelets of patients and discuss each of these. Um, intrauterine transfusions and, and neonates, pregnant women, HIV and immunodeficient, hematopoietic stem cell patients, and organ transplant patients. There is a committee, uh, advisory committee of a safe, safety of blood, tissues, and organs. It's part of the National Health Service in the UK. And they put out a position paper on this topic in 2012, which I, I find very interesting, and I'd like to go through some of it. There is at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that very well, but there is a um, website that's got all this information on it, and I'm going to be going through their conclusions. Intrauterine transfusions and neonates. Well, you know, for an average person, CMV causes a flu or cold-like symptoms. Uh, and for an intrauterine transfusion, if the fetus gets CMV, it's devastating. Uh, birth defects, um, severe disease, death, not uncommon. And uh, it's something that I think most people will agree that this is where you'd really want to use CMV negative products. And we'll look at the difference between CMV and LUCA reduced in a minute, but something, something uh, this deleterious you would want to avoid. Uh, having any chance of a CMV infection. And just to talk about CMV, of course, uh, if you're not familiar, it's um, a virus that is contained in the white cells. And so one of the things that happened when universal leuka reduction of blood products came along was that we were able to remove 99.9% .9 of the white cells. That dramatically decreases the risk of CMV infection being transfusion transmitted. And so uh, there's a, been a debate for years, is it better to use uh, Luca reduced products or CMV seronegative products or both. And uh, nowadays, we, most of the country, including us, uh, are using Luca reduced products for all of our red cells and platelets. 
Uh, you don't have to worry about that question anymore, about whether it should be liquor-used. Um, and I think it's pretty common, commonly held that, that CMV liquor-reduced is not sufficient for an intrauterine transfusion. For pregnant women, same story. And they are pointing out in this advisory committee report that you don't really need it during delivery, though. You don't need CMV negative products during delivery. The fetus isn't going to be getting that product, basically. Um, and in an emergency situation, if the mom needs platelets right now, it's considered uh, reasonable to go with the Luca reduced if you don't have time to get CMV negative. HIV and immunodeficient patients, again, I think this is pretty commonly held that they don't need CMV negative products. Now a controversial topic, stem cell transplant patients. Uh, several studies in the past have endorsed the use of CMV negative products. You can see that uh, previously they've done studies where one to four percent of patients getting CMV screen products could get CMV infection, whereas 28 to 57 percent of unscreened products, unlook reduced, unscreened for CMV products, were giving hematopoietic stem cell patients infection with CMV. Obviously, a huge uh, difference there. Bowden did the uh, first and largest study on this topic. He looked at seronegative blood, that would be CMV seronegative blood, or filtered blood, which would be leukoreduced blood. And they compared uh, in Seattle and Minneapolis uh, to see which one, if, if one was superior to the other. They did a primary analysis looking at days 21 through 100. And they started with day 21 there because they thought some people coming into the transplant setting may be carrying CMV and not antibody positive yet in the window period, basically. And so they wanted to start at day 21 to be a little more clean in looking at the question of transfusion transmission. Um, for uh, this, all CMV infections and disease, zero negative, uh, there were two or 1.3 percent. That 1.3 percent is not straight math, it's actuarial. And I don't understand how they did it. Uh, but you can see that if you divide 2 by 252, you get less than 1%. You don't get 1.3%. And the same with the, the number next to it. You've got a 2 for about the same number of n, and it's 2.4% actual da actuarial data. I don't know if it's from the Kaplan-Meier. I'm not sure how they did the calculation. But at any rate, the p-value there is 0. Um, I'm sorry, is 1. So there's no difference between them. CMV disease only, the p-value there was 0.25, so not significant. The secondary analysis was done to try to hone in on this, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, to try to zero in on this uh, process and, and really look at it under a microscope. So all CMV infections and disease, four versus six, p-value of 0.5, but here's where it becomes different. CMV disease only, there was zero in the CMV ca negative cases, and there were six cases in the filtered blood uh, so that p-value of 0 0.03 is less than 0 0.05, so that is significant. Survival was 79.82%, which was similar. So this was uh, an interesting article, and they concluded that since pre prior to the study, they decided since you can get up to 5% CMV infection with CMV negative products, they had decided before going into this study that if there was not a 5% difference between the two, then it wouldn't be something that would be considered significantly different. So, and they also realized that for the secondary analysis, some of those patients that were positive in the filtered blood side were actually having equivocal results on CMV testing. So it's not clear if they actually carried CMV into the situation. So Bowden and colleagues, uh, and Jeff McCullough and, and uh, other folks in Minnesota and Seattle, decided that, that they were comparable. They were the same risk overall, and a lot of places, including Seattle, which is the largest transplant center in the world for tra stem cells, uh, still uses uh, leukoreduced products instead of CMV negative. They don't use any CMV negative products. Uh, we have both at our blood center, and we provide both, obviously. Um, Lungman in Sweden showed no significant difference in infection or disease when patients received CMV negative and leukoreduced, which is what you would get now. If you ordered CMV negative, you'd get both. Uh, processes, or versus look reduced alone, which is our standard product. And so these two articles are arguing that there's not a difference that is significant. On the other hand, Van Vakas in, in 95 came out with an interesting meta-analysis. He looked at 878 recipients in 12 studies. And for, their, for that situation, risk of CMV infection was different 
uh, CMV negative 1.6 versus 3 for leukemia reduced. And for risk reduction, though, looking compared to unscreened units, both of these were heroes, 93 and 92% reduction in risk. So they were both a dramatic change from the previous setting. And yes, it does appear to me, and, and to Van Vaca certainly, that there is a slight edge to CMV negative. It is a little safer than Luca reduced. And um, when Van Bacchus looked at the three studies that most co directly compared Luca reduced and CMV negative, he saw these three bars going across. And the, the line in the middle is one. And if the diamonds lined up with the one, that would argue there's no favoring of CMV negative products versus Luca reduced products. And you can see that in all three of those, and in the summary odds ratio at the bottom, it's to the left of the one. So CMV negative is a little better. And, and that's hard to deny. Uh, and he, he made a, a calculation that, the, in fact, the CMV negative products were 61% reduction in risk compared to the Luca reduced products. Now, when you're looking at this situation, it's important to consider what the patient has in them already. If they've already had CMV and can get re uh, of that infection, uh, it's a little different than if they're negative and their donor, the stem cell donor, is negative. So that top line there, those are the ones that most particularly would need CMV negative products. Uh, the other situations where CMV has been in the donor or the patient or both, uh, one could make a stronger argument for, well, why not use Luca reduced? Why bother with CMV negative? Frankly, we have both. And I figure if you want to use CMV negative, fine. Um, but consider that 50% of the population is CMV positive, and therefore we don't always have CMV negative products. And you may have to wait a few hours to get a CMV negative product if that's your desire. And we can accommodate that. Um, the, uh, the other thought is, though, I believe with this data, it's pretty comfortable suggesting that Luca Reduce could be used instead of CMV negative in those cases where we don't have CMV negative available right this minute. I think the data is, is, is relatively close that, on that. And Nichols uh, pointed something interesting out. They looked at CMV negative negative, that is donor and, and recipient uh, transplants. And they, used, they, they uh, came up with a, um, <clears throat> the uh, primary predictor of transfusion transmitted CMV disease was whether or not a Luca reduced product from a CMV positive donor had been received. So this, again, argues that CMV negative screening is superior. And one of the interesting things about this study is they were able to study and monitor closely their patients for CMV. And they were able to jump on the infection right away before it turned into the disease, the pneumonitis or enteritis and, and causing death. So in that study, they were able to prevent with gancyclovir use all but one case of CMV uh, disease. So this uh, illustrates the, the value of early CMV detection and effective treatment, which we can now do even more effectively than they could years ago. We have PCR testing, we have valgancyclovir, we have uh, CMV immune globulin, um, people are, are more able to handle CMV, if you will, these days. Um, so the conclusions of that physician paper, that uh, advisory committee, uh, that CMV could replace Luca reduced for adults and kids and for patients who are potentially going to get a stem cell transplant in the future. Um, CMV PCR monitoring is advised for any patient getting CMV negative uh, because they could be getting it from a, a donor who is in the window period. You know, the donor is CMV positive but hasn't developed antibodies yet. We think they're okay, but they're seroconverting and they're infectious. So that's where that 1% to 4% could come from. Or it could come from person-to-person -person contact since 50% of adults have CMV. So um, we'll go to the last, sort of the orphan one here, uh, just to finish off. Organ transplant patients, there really isn't data that, that suggests that they really need to have CMV-negative products. This is a... a, a vital uh, and precious commodity that we need to save for those who really need it. And, and that physician paper, and I agree with it, would argue that a, a kidney transplant patient doesn't really need CMV negative products. Um, Luca reduced, which is what they'll get, of course, um, should work fine. And they're again suggesting keeping a close eye on CMV monitoring and treatment. Irradiated platelets and red cells, well, there is a whole list of well-documented indicators 
documented indications. Um, these are all probably pretty familiar. These are situations where if you had, since there are white cells, for those who aren't familiar with it, graft versus host disease from a transfusion is almost universally fatal. Graft versus host disease in a marrow transplant is about 20 or 30 percent fatal, to my understanding. Why the difference? Well, we can talk about that in a second. Uh, the problem is that when a uh, patient is getting a transfusion, there are going to be a few white cells. Even though we take most of them out, uh, there are going to be a few white cells in there. We start with 5 billion in a bag of whole blood, and we end up dropping that to less than 5 times 10 to the 6. So it's a thousand-fold decrease of white cells. But there's still enough white cells in there to cause graft versus host disease, where the white cells from the transfusion recognize the patient as foreign and destroy his bone marrow and his liver and his skin and his gut and kills him. It's, it's almost universally fatal in about three weeks. So if you have a question or a concern about it, just irradiate it. It's much safer. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, and there are differences of opinion among uh, oncologists uh, in this next uh, slide. Potential indications for irradiated products would include those uh, malignancies treated with cytotoxic agents or donor-recipient pairs from genetically homogeneous populations. For example, in Japan, 97% of the people there are Japanese. They have very close HLA-type matching. And one person walking down the street to another transfusion may cause graft-versus-host disease that's transfusion-based uh, and may kill that, that recipient. So they, they irradiate all their cellular products in Japan for that reason. We're a much bigger mix here, so we don't tend to worry about it as much. But that has been suggested as a possibility for this country as well. Um, patients, uh, actually, I wanted to mention the, the, the confusion that occurs when one doc in a Hemont group says, I wanted the products for this patient irradiated, then his colleague on call comes along and says, no, I don't think it needs to be irradiated, drives the blood bank people crazy. But fortunately, you have smart Hemont and blood bank docs here. You just irradiate all of them for the Hemont patients. That's what I'm used to at other places where I've worked. Uh, it, it is much wiser, I think, to just say, if that's a hemonc patient, we're going to irradiate the products. Don't mess around with trying to uh, decide one needs it and one doesn't need it. It doesn't hurt the product. So I, I applaud that, that process. Um, and it doesn't always happen. It doesn't happen in Des Moines. Uh, so um, usually not indicated for getting irradiated products would be patients with HIV, uh, hemoglobinopathy, such as sickle cell or thalassemia, term infants, or non-immune suppressed patients. Washed red cells and platelets. Well, you're usually dealing with a patient with an allergic reaction. And with these patients, the, the plan usually is to pre-med with Benadryl. And if they break through, give them some more Benadryl. But you're sort of limited because you've already given them some. And if it's a severe reaction, you go on to epinephrine and H2 blockers and steroids. And then you think about the next transfusion. Well, you pre-med with Benadryl again. Um, or the other option is, if they've had a severe transfusion reaction, I would suggest using washed platelets um, in, in, or washed red cells, of course. And what we do is, for two or three hours, we put saline with the cells, mix it up, spin it down so that the platelets, say, go down to the bottom, take off the supernatant, put in saline, mix it up again. We take off the plasma proteins, and that's what people are reacting to with allergic reactions to plasma proteins. And one thing I wanted to mention, I learned this at Mayo Clinic, and I really found it valuable over the years, is an additional med you can put into this situation, doxepine, Sinequan's another name for it. It's a tricyclic antidepressant. It's also a strong antihistaminic, and it can be used as a pre-med instead of Benadryl. What I use is 25 milligrams a half an hour before the transfusion, and if they break through, then I can give Benadryl. But I have the benefit there of giving two drugs. I, I'm already loaded up with doxepine. Now I can give Benadryl. And I can give more Benadryl this time because I didn't give it in the first place. And the one side effect that I found uh, from doxepine is sleepiness. Low levels, not too much, but at the higher levels, it, it, get, it makes patients somewhat sleepy. Um, there are some contraindications, which I'm not sure I've run into very many patients that I've not been able to use doxepine on when they've had allergic reactions. But for example, neuroangular glaucoma, urinary retention, MAO inhibitors, or of course, hypersensitivity to doxepine or another tricyclic antidepressant. Uh, the way it's used, the way I was taught to use it is 25 milligrams. And if you break through, use Benadryl. Uh, next transfusion, increase the doxepine to 50 milligrams pre-med. And then if you break through on that, go up higher, 
200 maximum is the maximum I've ever seen used at Mayo and it's the maximum I've ever used. But at some point or another, and I, I treat patients with uh, thalassemia, with sickle cell disease, we, we treat patients with sickle cell disease, trans um, <coughs> excuse me, we transfuse those patients um, with eight units of red cells every month for years. And we treat TTP patients with 15 units of plasma every day for weeks. And we often see patients with allergic reactions, but I've never seen a patient that we couldn't stop reactions and prevent further ones using doxepine. It's not good for stopping the reaction as it's happening. It's got to be used as a pre-med. But I find that very, very interesting, very useful. Last topic, granulocytes. Another controversial topic. I don't know. I, I could take a hand vote here. Who's a, who's a believer and who's not a believer? I, I'll do that in a minute. Um, Granulocyte concentrates are collected by an apheresis machine, and the donor is stimulated by GCSF and steroids to bump the white count to 30,000 or so the day uh, of the collection. And then it's collected and given to the patient, and it looks like blood because it's got red cell contaminants, so we have to ABO match it. Uh, but it, the indications are bacterial or fungal infections that have gone 48 hours with appropriate antibiotics but not responding well and a neutrophil count that's less than 500. You need some white cells to fight bacteria and funguses. Also, if you have CGDs, well, you have white cells, but they don't work, um, and in bad infection, it's an indication for using granulocytes. Minimal dose is 10 to the 10th. Transfusions usually occur daily until the infection is resolved or until the count's greater than 500. Typically, this takes about five days. And clinical data in the past, you may have heard that granulocytes don't work at all. Uh, a lot of those previous studies had been not stimulated donors. In other words, they didn't give them steroids, they didn't give them GCSF, so they took just a guy off the street, drew white cells on them. They're not going to get very many, and they weren't enough to, to stop the process. One thing I find very interesting is that everybody pretty much agrees that these work great in babies. If you've got a baby with a sepsis and a low white count, you give him granulocytes, he's going to pull out of it. Why? Because it's a huge dose relative to his body. And if we could give that same huge dose to a, an adult, we'd probably have no, no um, concern do granulocytes work or not. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the ring study, we probably aren't giving enough granulocytes, even with the stimulated uh, to a certain extent. We probably need to give two a day. But I don't know if anyone's going to get to that point. The ring study was this big study. Everybody planned. We're going to answer the question once and for all across the country. Unfortunately, they had so many problems with enrollment they had, as far as I've heard, they, they haven't moved forward with the ring study. I think they're, they're actually stopping it, which is sad because it's a, it's a great question to ask. Uh, and evidently there are believers, like myself, I've seen them work, uh, and uh, there are believers who don't want to risk the patient enrolling and then not getting the granulocytes. He's got a dying patient. He wants to give granulocytes. He doesn't want to take a 50-50 chance of the patient not getting granulocytes. So he's not going to enroll that patient. And then there's the non-believers, and they're not going to enroll the patient. So it may stay a religious debate forever. I don't know. It's unfortunate. I've seen patients with bad infections uh, and resolve those infections. You know, it'll look like hopeless situations, resolve those infections. So cardia and various infections with fungal and bacterial infections. Um, so last slide, the summary uh, platelets are either apheresis or acidose uh, here. And fibrinogen is the main thing cryoprecipitate ends up being used for. CMB negative products, it's clear, I believe, for most people that in utero situations, pregnant women and neonates should get CMB neg zero negative products. And for stem cell patients, we have them. Why not use them? Uh, but just consider if you don't have it, the leukoreduce reduce is probably a pretty good substitute. Irradiated products are for immunodeficient patients. Uh, you use wash products, red cells, or platelets for ser severe allergic reactions that cannot be prevented. And granulocytes, well, it's a religious debate. I've seen them work, and we may never get that resolved. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Are there any uh, long-term effects on your donors, particularly your platelet donors? That's a great question. It's been looked at, and I believe they have not found any significant effects. Uh, the, the platelets are replenished very easily, and I've not heard of anybody having a platelet dyscrasia uh, as a result of, of platelet transfusion, or donations, rather. Uh, the other 
thought would be that we're taking off some lymphocytes with these as well, uh, not a lot, but some, and would lymphocyte uh, depletion affect the patient over time, the donor over time? And I believe the answer is no. Uh, I haven't looked at that information lately, but I think the, the, the thoughts are that no, that doesn't have caused trouble. There was a, a concern about granulocytes, though. If you're stimulating somebody with GCSF and steroids on a frequent basis to be a granulocyte donor, is that safe for the patient? And there was a little concern or question about that. You're stimulating the marrow repeatedly, and, and what effect will that have? Um, last I heard, people said, well, we should have our granulocyte donors donate you know, three times a year and then go on to somebody else uh, if necessary. Find somebody else to, to be a granulocyte donor uh, just because people were a little paranoid about having an effect. So I hope that answers your question. Bruce, <coughs> yes. uh, Larry Ottoman, this is not specifically about the topic you've covered, but I, I have you captured, so I'll ask you anyway. Um, this has to do with uh, blood donor eligibility. Yes. And I had a patient that uh, told me that a new screening question for them was whether they had undergone a colonoscopy in the last 30 days. It, uh, can you give me a little bit of background on that? Yes. Um, if you have a colonoscopy, you may have a little bacteremia. And if that persists and the bacteremia has set up shop but not caused clinical symptoms, this has come from Europe. The thinking over in Europe has been, we're going to really worry about this, and uh, it's, it's starting to filter over in this direction. Um, so I don't know that it's that huge of a difference. I've had colonoscopies, and I've never had any problems with them, but I guess theoretically I could have a, a little septicemia that would last and then get knocked out, but during the time period that it, it lasts, I could donate, I got transfused it to someone else. Uh, that's the thought on that. Other questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs>